right, welcome back to Hypnosis Chat. I believe we're on episode 22. All right, so today is a special Hypnosis Chat. I want to take some time to answer some questions that I've been getting. Um, so, <clears throat> and uh, I've got my wife, Anjali, here, who has agreed to read me some of the questions. All um, right, welcome back. These are very common questions that I get. And if you have any questions over the course of the stream, feel free to send them in either by email or um, by commenting on the live video. Okay, so what do we have first? Well, what is the best way to lose weight? Okay, all right. So uh, definitely a question that I get a lot. And um, so there are basically four aspects to weight loss and some of them are more important than others uh, the four aspects are uh, number one whether you are eating because you're hungry or whether you're eating for any other reason and usually they're stress or boredom related reasons uh, but the only thing food does well is uh, meet your hunger need and that's if it's the right type of food in the right amount. So food is very limited on what it actually is able to do for you. It really can only meet your hunger need and only under certain circumstances. So that's the first one, eating only because you're actually hungry. Um, number two is uh, eating the right types of food. Number three is eating the right amount of food when you actually eat. And number four is exercise. So those are the four ways that you can use to lose weight. So what I want to talk about is um, the one, there's one principle that is, uh, there, each of those four things are used for something else. For example, exercise is not effective for losing weight. Okay, let me say that again. Exercise is not effective for losing weight. And the weight loss industry, exercise industry, Everybody would hate me for saying that, but if you continue to eat a lot of unhealthy food and exercise a lot, you're not going to lose weight. And it's not because you get more muscle and the muscle replaces the fat. That's not the case. The purpose of exercise is not to lose weight. It'll give you a little bit of a bonus and it will help you. Um, and that's why it's in one of the four categories, but it's not the main way that you lose weight. Uh, the main advantage that you get from weight loss, and it's kind of an unpopular fact because you, you can't sell as many exercise equipments if you know the truth, but or if you tell people the truth, but the fact of the matter is the purpose of exercise is to increase your cardiovascular health. And people who pe most people who want to lose weight, they don't really care that much about their cardiovascular health. They don't care if they're going to die of a heart attack in 20 years. They care that they look fat in their profile pictures right now. And that's why it just doesn't sell that well. And that's why you're not going to hear this fact that weight, that exercise does not is not the primary way to lose weight. Um, now, exercise, uh, just to be perfectly clear, exercise is essential. And everyone should exercise the recommended amount of times per week because of your cardiovascular health. You want to you want to have strong heart and lungs in order to have a good life and live a long time, um, and it does help a little bit with losing weight. It does artificially increase your metabolism, which is good in most cases. Um, so that's what that's for. Um, likewise, now here's another really interesting topic: the type of food you eat is not primarily for weight loss. In the exact same way, this is a very similar type of idea. Um, there, there have been a number of uh, kind of solo pseudo experiments where one recent one I read about was there was a nutrition professor who um, he limited his calorie intake to 1800 calories a day, which is re pretty low, but he only ate Twinkies. Okay. Um, so 10 Twinkies. <laughs> right. He would eat like 10 Twinkies a day. And guess what? He lost weight. Oh boy. He lost weight because he was only eating 10 Twinkies a day. <laughs> But I seriously doubt his body was getting the nutrition. I know it wasn't, obviously, getting the nutrition that it needed. It wasn't repairing itself as well as it possibly could have. Um, and I'm sure that if you went your whole life eating 10 Twinkies a day, sure, you'd lose weight. 
but you would not live very long. Okay, so um, uh, reducing, so this is kind of the opposite actually of exercise. It's very good for losing weight, but it's not very good for your health. It, it, it helps, you know, so if exercise is 90% or let's say 80% for cardiovascular health and 20% for losing weight, the, the amount of food that you eat is 80% for losing weight and 20% for your health. So that's amount of food. Um, and also that gets into the type of food issue. Um, the purpose of eating healthy food is not to lose weight. The purpose of eating healthy food is to, so your body can get the nutrition that it needs to heal, repair itself, grow, um, uh, fight off um, invaders, etc. So um, exercise is not primarily for weight loss. It's for cardiovascular health. The type of food you eat is not primarily for um, uh, for weight loss. It's for your personal nutritional health. The amount of food you eat per meal, and of course, whether you eat for emotional reasons or not, directly translates it in, into the amount of food you eat. The amount of food you eat is a, is the biggest factor in whether you'll actually lose weight. Eating healthy food and exercising are for being a healthy person regardless of your weight so just to be perfectly clear all four of those things are vitally important to be a healthy person uh, but the ones that are for weight loss are just about amount of food amount of food is the primary determinant of your actual weight um, and the type of food and exercise is the primary or one of the two of the primary factors of how healthy you're going to be as a person Okay, that is the real facts. That is not gonna sell exercise machines. Fortunately, I'm not selling those. Um, it's not gonna sell diet pills. Fortunately, I'm not selling those. So I, I'm in a unique position where I can actually tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I like being in that position. Okay, so, all right, so good question. Um, okay, so tell you what, we've, we, we can do, I could talk for weeks about weight mm -hmm. loss. Let's go on to the next question. What else do we have here? Um, what do you do to deal with stuttering? Okay, stuttering. That is a question I do get sometimes. Um, and stuttering is um, almost always psychological. Um, there are certain things that are almost always psychological, and stuttering is one of them. It's usually not a physical problem. Sometimes it is, but that's pretty rare. If you stutter, it's probably a psychological issue. You are probably um, internally questioning yourself. Um, you are probably thinking about things that are making you nervous and those things result in stuttering in a lot of people. So what I would say is just as the first step for someone, and we're not talking about hypnosis right now, um, the first step for someone, let's just say that you stutter, is um, I want you to imagine for a second that you are a professional baseball player. And so you're a professional baseball player. Um, and you have acquired the ability, the superpower ability of slowing the ball down 20%. You could slow the whole world down by 20% and no one knows. You can just slow it down by 20%. Now you are actually a professional baseball player, so you're very, very good at baseball. Um, you didn't just magically acquire that job. You're actually a professional baseball player and you can slow the world down by 20%. And of course, no one would know because everyone was slowed down by 20%. The world might be slowed down right now by 20% and I would never know because my brain's working at 20% and it would match the 20% and it would seem like it's going at full speed. So you now have the superpower ability of slowing the world down by 20%, except you are still able to swing the bat at full speed. Okay, so that's a huge difference. If you just slowed everything down by 20%, you wouldn't know either because you would also go at 20%. You might have that ability now, but your superpower ability is that you can maintain the regular 100% speed, even though the world is slowed down to 80% speed. That would be a massive benefit or advantage to you when you're hitting a baseball with a bat. Um, it would be far more than just 20%. Like if you could slow the ball down by 20% and swing at full speed, you would be massively more successful than just 20% more successful. So I want to compare that to someone who's stuttering. Most of the time when people are stuttering, 
they are trying to get words out faster than their mouth is able to do it. Um, and that could be because of anxiety or whatever. So the first thing I tell people just to kind of start off is to slow down your speech by 20%. If you slow down your speech by 20%, you will have far more than a 20% improvement in your speaking performance. So, and then there's other things going on. We, we definitely would need to address why are you having anxiety? What are you doing to have anxiety? Again, that's, we could do a whole series of videos just on that. But I would say the first step for someone who's stuttering, train yourself to slow down your speech by 20%. And clients I've had have had great success with that. And then of course we deal with the more fundamental issues of why are you having anxiety when you're thinking about it? What are you thinking that is creating the anxiety? How can we change that? Okay, so, but I think that's a, that would be a good step to, to train yourself to slow your speech down. That would be a thing that you could do right now if you wanted to. Okay, so uh, let's, why don't we take another question? Great. Uh, how do I deal with being indecisive? Okay, so. I don't know uh, what to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what to say about that. <laughs> no. Um, so uh, generally when people are indecisive, one of the, the probably I'd say the main reason for that is that they have a bit of perfectionism where they want to find exactly the right answer or action and um, they, they don't do this consciously but unconsciously they think oh well I have to find the perfect thing or else it won't be good enough and then they can't decide because they can't think of a perfect thing. The reality is you're never going to think of the perfect thing. You're never going to do the perfect thing. You're never going to say the perfect thing. Um, and if you try to do that, you're going to be harming yourself more than um, benefiting. So, um, and you know, it's kind of, you know, this is an interesting issue for me because we have different levels of ways of dealing with things. So for, and there's from simple to more complex. So. Uh, like children, like young children have very simple ways of dealing with things like anxiety, fear, excitement, and so on. So for example, you know, uh, if they're anxious, like a young child might cry. Now, as you get older, crying becomes less acceptable. So you have to do something else. So a slightly more complex behavior would be like getting angry. So they might get angry because they don't want to cry or crying isn't doing it anymore or whatever. Um, still a very simple way of dealing with it. And then later maybe they learn to compromise or negotiate. Um, and then later they might learn even more complex skills. So as we get older, we hopefully learn more and more complex and useful skills. Um, so, uh, and, and for example, like if an adult has anger issues, it's usually not anything that's wrong with them. It's usually that they're just using a much simpler way of dealing with anxiety than they could use. And they usually have, most people have the ability to learn a more complex and useful skill than being angry. So, and that's what that would be about. So um, if someone's being indecisive, it, so, so analogous to that, so if you're anxious and you get angry as a simple response, um, when someone wants to be successful, perfectionism is a simple response. It's an overly simplistic response. So when a young child wants to do something, they might want to do it perfectly, uh, or maybe even a little bit older, like an older child, or maybe even a, a you know a young teenager might want to have like perfectionism. They want to get it absolutely right. Um, but that's not the most complex or useful ability. And hopefully as they get older, you what you want to learn is more complex and versatile ways of thinking about this. For example, you might want to say, um, like, okay, well, what is a better solution than the one we have right now? Okay, so we're doing this, but we need something Sorry, better. I don't know how to help with that. Wow, well, Google doesn't know how to help with that. Isn't that amazing? Coming up with solutions. Google, you, you heard it here first. Google doesn't know how to help with that. <laughs> Alexa and Google, very indecisive. Very indecisive. They don't know how to help you with that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, the uh, so being 
Usually people who are indecisive have like a perfectionist streak about them. And I want you to think of perfectionism as an overly simplistic way of trying to be successful. And there are better ways of trying to be successful. Um, again, for example, it could be, well, what are we doing now? Let's just come up with something that's better. And then we'll reevaluate that and then come up with something that's even better than that. That might not be the best one, but it's certainly better than just trying to be perfect every time. So I would say as kind of an initial tip for someone, if they feel like they're indecisive, examine to see, well, am I trying to come up with a perfect solution? If so, that's not bad. It's just, you can probably do something more complex and versatile. So instead say, okay, well, what is a better solution than what we currently have? What is, or alternately, like what is the best way that I can handle this right now with the tools that I have available? Let me come up with a few ideas, brainstorm, and select one that I think might be the best. That's more complex and it's more versatile, has fewer disadvantages, and you'll probably be able to make decisions more easily. So, okay. Um, oh yeah, and <laughs> there's, there's an old joke. <laughs> There's an old joke. Uh, I didn't come up with this joke. There's an old joke that says, you know, if you're, if you're, you and your friend are being chased by a bear, you don't have to run faster than the bear. You just have to run faster than your friend. <laughs> so the point is, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to have something a little better than what you had before. Okay. All right. So uh, that's good on that one. So why don't we uh, go ahead and take another question? Um, what is the best way to handle anxiety? Okay, anxiety. Um, obviously, that's a very common issue, probably the most common issue that I help people with. Um, so I want to talk about anxiety in a little more detail um, than I have in the past. So I want you to imagine, okay, so we have an elevator and the elevator is rated for a certain amount of weight. Likewise, your brain is rated for a certain amount of stress. Stress is, um, so stress and anxiety are different. Stress is what the outside world gives you. So if you have to think about something or solve a problem or someone goes around the corner and says, boo, those are all things that create stress for various amounts of time. Anxiety is something that you do to yourself um, when the stressor is no longer happening. So if you continue to think about it, even when it's not happening, that's anxiety. So stress is usually not under your control and anxiety is under your control. So what happens, um, what, what are some, what are things that happen that when you have too much anxiety? So it's just like if an elevator has too much weight on it, let's say it's weighted for 2000 pounds, but you really need to get your elephant to the next floor. Okay. So you've got your elephant in the elevator with you and Okay, it works fine the first time, but then you realize you have to get your elevator, your elephant up there every day. Okay, so over time, this is gonna to create too much stress on the elevator, and the elevator might have a few ways that it's gonna deal with that. Um, one way is just, you know, the simple way is just like the cables snap, everyone falls, it's, it's a disaster, okay? So um, we don't want that to happen. Now your brain is a little more complex than that, it's got some, systems that it puts in place to try to prevent disasters from happening. Um, so, uh, so, so the elevator falling would just be analogous to like a nervous breakdown. It's just like you, it's the person snaps and that's it. It's over. Um, okay. So now the, again, the brain has some systems in place that will help you, um, avoid disaster. It's still not good, but it helps you avoid disaster. Let's just say that, um, the, you know, you've got your elevator, your elephant in the elevator and, you know, the cables snap, but then the, the elevator puts these brakes on and it's able to stop before it hits the ground and it just stays there and it, the elevator automatically repairs itself while it's got these brakes on. Definitely better than disaster. I mean, it wouldn't be very convenient, but definitely better than plummeting to your death. So that's definitely an improvement. Uh, that is what I call depression. So depression is where your brain's like, okay, we don't want to completely snap. We're going to put the brakes on. That's why depression is not really about sadness. It's about apathy. It's about being really tired. It's about sleeping all day because your, your brain has put the brakes on and it's repairing itself. It's like, you're not going anywhere until 
you know, you obviously can't follow the sign that says no elephants on the elevator. So we're going to stop and repair and you just have to wait here while we do this. Okay, so that's depression. Now, um, as it starts repairing itself, um, it'll get to a certain point of repair where it's functional, but it's not fully repaired yet. And your brain kind of has a choice. You can say, okay, well, first of all, we're, we're just gonna stay here and you're just going to remain here until it's repaired. And that's what I would call chronic depression. If you have just depress depressive episodes all the time, or like, let's just say it lets you go for a little bit, but then it just stops it. That would be kind of a, and, and you, you spend more time down than moving in the elevator. That would be chronic depression. Um, now let's just say it's like, okay, so are you gonna not bring your, do you agree to not bring your elephant on the elevator anymore? And you're like, yes, I agree. But then you bring your elephant back, of course. Um, and then the, but the elevator starts, okay, we're gonna start working again, even though we're not fully repaired, because you said you're going to not bring your elephant, but of course you bring your elephant and it has to do it again, it has to stop again. And it goes through this period of, of stopping and repairing and then letting you have it back and then stopping and repairing. That's what I call bipolar disorder. Again, better than the alternative. Notice how these are not bad things. These are ways that the elevator is preventing disaster from happening. Um, you know, you're the one that brought the, eleva the elephant onto the elevator. The elevator is just trying to deal with it as best as it can without dropping everything on the ground. Okay, so what's the real solution? The real solution is to understand how much weight the elevator can hold and make sure that you don't give it more weight than, than it's rated for. So with that understanding in place, your brain is not the enemy. Your brain is not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. Your brain is doing its best to deal with all of the anxiety that this person may be generating. Um, and the real solution is only going to be in you managing how much weight you put on the elevator every day and making sure it stays within standards um, rather than just doing, letting it do whatever it wants or you know, letting the elephant come on whatever it wants and just not paying attention to it. So you have to start taking control of that. And uh, you know, again, I could talk weeks about how to take control of that and I do have some other videos about that. Um, in fact, we just did a video on performance anxiety which does outline a lot of those principles. So, uh, your brain is not the enemy. You, the manager of your brain, have to make sure that your brain is not being overtaxed with anxiety. And that is absolutely something that is within your control. So I'd say that's really the only real solution to someone who habitually has anxiety. So somebody might ask, um, what, how do I know this stuff? How do I know what to do? Um, how do I understand how my brain works or how to think, how to change these things. How do I do all this? So, and of course there are principles for that. And again, we could talk for weeks about all those principles, uh, but I want to leave you with this. So let's just say that you were, um, you were on an alien planet. You were um, just stranded there. You took your spaceship there. You ran out of gas. You're on the alien planet. They're very friendly. Uh, but the only job you can get is as a comedian. That's just the only job you can get. So you you are now a comedian on this alien planet. Now, because they're aliens, you don't really know what makes them laugh. Like with human comedians, we kind of make certain assumptions about what makes people laugh, but aliens, you'd have to figure it out. So how would you start? You'd say, oh, you know, maybe you'd make some alien friends and start like telling some jokes and see what they laugh at, take some notes. Uh, you know, hey, what about this? Do you think this is funny? What kind of, you know, you'd get ideas, you'd try different things out. And then after a while, you would learn what they find funny and you'd come up with a routine and then you could start your job as an alien comedian. That is exactly the attitude that you should take toward how to think about things correctly. Oh, so, okay, so I have too much anxiety. What do I do about that? Well, when I think about this, does that create anxiety? Well, what if I think about it this way? Does that, do I feel a little better about that? When you take that attitude toward yourself, you will learn in a way that you could never learn from someone else, um, at least not you know, exactly at what is good for you, um, about how to think about things. How can I think about this thing without having anxiety? Most people don't do that. In fact, I would say almost no one does that. People don't think on purpose. They think reactively. So um, do this exercise. Um, where you, okay, so what is something that creates anxiety? How, and this is something that, let's say this is homework. 
something that you can do tonight and think about. What if I think about it this way? How much anxiety do I feel? How do I feel about that? What if I think about it this way? Um, and then keep working until you find something that kind of works. It's like, okay, and most people, here's what most people do. Most people be like, oh, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that. I have no idea. But then they would, if they actually did the exercise, they'd be like, oh, okay, now I'm starting to get it. This is a little better than this. Uh, I noticed that when I, you know, when I think about, uh, you know, my, my, you know, uh, my job where I have to stay at home in this way, I feel a little less anxiety when I think about it this way. And experimenting with different ways of thinking is the best way for you to immediately learn what works best for you. So take this alien comedian attitude and figure out how your brain talks, how your brain reacts to things, and pick out the best ways that work the best for you and start putting those into your daily life. Okay, so that's about all the time we have for today. Uh, Anjali, thank you very much for joining me and helping me. Thank I always you so appreciate much it. for having Absolutely. me on again. All right, and feel free to add your questions. And we do have a little, we, we have a word from our sponsor. Everyone has tried and failed to make personal changes, but it's not failure that defines you. It's whether you allow that failure to defeat you or whether you seek the tools necessary to make the change you want for your life. Our society does not want you to solve your problems. It makes more money off of you when you're sick, fat, and crazy than it does when you're healthy. It's up to you to take control of your own life, and that's exactly what you're going to do starting right now. Okay, thank you all very much and see you next time. Thank you, everyone.